questions. Welcome to chapter 13 where we're going to be looking at doing business in emerging markets i.e. these are markets uh, which are not overly developed so there's not huge amounts of um, advanced businesses within these markets but it also means that there are lots of opportunities within these markets specifically we're going to be looking at Africa as an emerging market okay Eight, 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 Eight, 0 0.5 Eight, 0 0.5 So we're going to cover Africa's economic, social, political and institutional performance. Uh, we're going to look at the impact of technology in Africa, uh, where Africa falls within the global economy, development, uh, the business environment in Africa, and we're going to specifically look at do reasons for doing business in Africa and reasons why it is more challenging to do business in Africa too. Okay, um, there's often a very pessimistic view of Africa uh, that uh, nothing works, um, it is poorly resourced, but it is also a very poorly researched business environment and often painted quite negatively by the Western media, which tends to dominate um, our views. Okay, so a number of things have been happening in Africa. Africa is becoming more democratic in many interests, in many instances, but also trades becoming liberalised. In other words, trade is becoming, where well, it's becoming easier to do trade within Africa and to open business in Africa, and costs of doing business in Africa are also declining with increased technology, and very importantly is that profits are increasing in Africa because this is an underutilised market. Um, coming into this market can be very profitable for businesses. So Africa is also at the same time becoming more transparent so people are being able to understand what happens in Africa and better predict uh, the impact of different events on business and we've got something called NEPAD which is a new partnership for African development which is aiming to open up Africa's borders and enable the transport of goods and services across these borders in Africa. So okay, I've got a video for you, opportunities and challenges in uh, of doing business in Africa. Uh, it's some interesting perspectives because it interviews a whole lot of business people in Africa and provides some practical insights into what the challenges and opportunities are. As usual, I provide you with the details of how you can access the video. And as usual, guys, sit down, summarize for yourself, answer the thing. The point when you sit down and answer the questions for yourself, guys, um, or when you analyze what the different advantages and disadvantages are in the video guys it enables you to um, analyze for yourself but also you remember more effectively if you have sat down and taken the trouble to write it up you've used more of your senses in the process Okay, so guys, um, what are the challenges of doing business in Africa? One of the key challenges is infrastructure. So they mentioned in the video um, that uh, a lot of time is taken up by doing things that you shouldn't need to be doing. For example, providing power for yourself or providing water for yourself. Um, or um, they also mention that uh, traveling to work and uh, distributing products etc is a challenge and that in Africa people spend up to 30% of their income simply commuting to work. 
So it takes up a huge amount of time and money unnecessarily where you're paying for generators or uh, having to store your own water, etc. And because the roads are so bad, um, spend a lot of time getting to work. Uh, they mention also that health is a huge problem in Africa. There's only one doctor per 2,000 people in Africa, which is probably an optimistic number. Um, so uh, there's not good health care in Africa. They mention that food is a challenge. So while Africa has half of the world's fertile land, much is unused and undeveloped. So providing food, both that the markets require or desire, and just feeding the people in Africa is a problem. So they have pointed out a number of challenges of doing business in Africa. At the same time, they also point out there are a number of opportunities. These opportunities include that governments are spending huge amounts on education and that on average about 20% of budgets in Africa are spent on education compared to uh, between 8 and 12% in more developed countries. Okay, so people are becoming more educated in Africa, uh, which has the advantage that you have more skilled workers, etc. Okay, uh, there are innovation labs opening up all over Africa, so new products and services are being developed. Africa is also the fastest growing economy of all the continents, um, so um, there's more opportunities for business uh, within Africa. And specifically in terms of mobile connectivity, where the rest of the world is pretty connected, um, Africa is growing and it provides lots of opportunities for uh, firms related to um, internet and mobile um, connectivity. Uh, infrastructure is improving in Africa over to all, so we're building better roads, uh, better internet, uh, better education facilities, uh, dams, you name it, airports. Um, an example um, that's not in the video is um, Ethiopian Airlines, which is now the biggest hub in Africa, surpassing um, Emirates service to Africa. So um, there is opportunities in Africa and Africa is improving. And then data, a huge amount of data is uh, becoming available about, South, about Africa. And in many regards, Africa is becoming more stable. So democracies are becoming more stable, less wars, etc., which makes it easier to do business. Okay, if we look at the formal slides, guys, um, I know the slide is a little bit dated, I couldn't find a more recent one, but the, the point is gross domestic product, so the, the amount of dollars per person um, in Africa per year, so the average amount of uh, business conducted per person in Africa is growing every year. So um, it means that there's opportunities that people are spending more money and it is more business happening in Africa, which is a vital perform or business opportunity in Africa. The reality is also, guys, that Africa has poor quality of life in many regards. We've got lots of poor people and people who live in poverty. And in terms of business, these people are not great because they don't have money to spend on goods and services. Um, more specifically, they don't have money to spend on uh, your middle and upper uh Price goods and services. However, these also present an opportunity because they also require goods and services in terms of food, uh, uh, fuels, 
data, etc. And it's referred to as the bottom of the pyramid. So it doesn't mean just that people are poor that they won't buy anything. It's just the type of goods that they buy. So it also provides an opportunity for many business in Africa. If you think of Vodacom and their um, lower price data bundles, etc., um, often aimed at the poor within South Africa. That's an example of um, utilizing the bottom of the pyramid. The table here is also again um, not the most recent table unfortunately, but if you look at different countries guys, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has got the lowest life expectancy of the globe. So our life expectancy in Sub-Saharan Africa is around 50 years old. SSA is Sub-Saharan Africa. As compared to, for example, East Asia, which is 72, and OECD countries, which is Europe, etc., which the um, life expectancy is 79 years old. Okay. Um, and you can see that life expectancy and gross domestic product go hand in hand. So a fairly small increase in GDP leads to increased life expectancy. So if you compare um, South Sub-Saharan Africa with Southeast Asia, um, they, it's about a thousand dollars difference per year, but it's got a huge impact on life expectancy. So in terms of human development, which ranges from everything from education to um, healthcare to infrastructure, etc., Africa also has the lowest uh, develop human development index scores, while um, Europe has the highest, my Arab states are somewhere in between. So we have got a long way to go in terms of improving living standards in Africa. Which one did you do? Okay. The video mentioned healthcare as well. So Africa is problematic in terms of healthcare. Uh, we have limited hospitals, limited doctors. Uh, people are undernourished because they are poor, so they struggle to provide for themselves, which means that they are more susceptible to diseases. So um, we have very high under five mortality rates, which is indicative of developing societies, i.e. a lot of our children don't make it past five years old compared to Europe where most children survive for in the first five years of life uh, when you're most vulnerable. So problems like TB, HIV, AIDS, um, and the current um, COVID-19 pandemic uh, I expect by the time that you are reading these notes that the COVID-19 pandemic will have taken hold in Africa and that we will be having huge numbers of deaths, etc. because we don't have the health resources to um, look after these people and to um, look after our sick at the end of the day. So it has an implication with healthcare that our skilled workers get sick and sometimes die, and uh, our um, we our gross domestic product is not growing enough. I.e., we cannot afford these healthcare facilities. Another challenge in Africa is civil war and conflict. There tend to be a lot of wars in Africa. Um, in fact, a lot of proxy wars happen in Africa, i.e. Uh, countries uh, fight wars between each other while in someone else's country. Um, so um, war has a very negative impact on business because resources are used for buying weapons and supplying the army etc so destruction of physical and human capital because things get blown up and burnt down uh, people don't get to save money people can't work because they at war um, so uh, also money leaves these countries because people are not 
um, investors are not confident in these countries, therefore they do not invest in them, so that you have what is called a capital flight, and economies are disrupted. You can't do business when people are shooting at each other. And then, as I already said, the government's expenditure is distorted from provision of public services to spending it on the military. So, uh, civil war and war has a huge impact. Uh, if you want a good example, the conflict in Yemen, which uh, is largely um, financed by the United Arab Emirates and by the United States, etc., where thousands of people are dying every day, um, and um, literally it's one of the poorest countries on earth currently. A huge problem in Africa is the level of corruption. The problem with corruption is it makes business more expensive to conduct because you have to pay people extra to get things done and also money that should be going towards providing public services is stolen at the end of the day. Um, unfortunately South Africa has been a prime example of this in recent years with our friends the Guptas and um, state capture and every day we read about um, corruption in the newspapers etc so it has a number of negative consequences so it raises the cost of doing business in Africa because money gets diverted um, to bribes to uh, or gets stolen uh, it's price of developing programs um, gets um, inflated I just look at your newspapers every day and the costs of for example of the food parcels during the COVID-19 epidemic where the government's paying 200 rand for a food parcel and it's maybe got 100 rands worth of food in it i.e. someone is basically stealing the money along the line so corruption also undermines tax and revenue collection because uh, uh, the your uh, tax officials get bribed, etc. And instead of the money going to government, it goes into other people's pockets, which just does not get paid. And resources go to um, places they shouldn't do. And your economy does not get it developed as much as it should be. And then public officials are corrupt and um, regulatory frameworks, i.e. laws and regulations, are used to generate uh, bribes rather than to enable business. So in Africa, democracy is a controversial topic. Uh, the, the point of democracy, it makes governments accountable, i.e. if you're not happy with the government's performance, you vote them out at the next election. However, in Africa, this often doesn't happen because elections are rigged or um, there's simply not other choices uh, to make in terms of voting in new governments, etc. So the point is creating checks and balances and that democracy is argued to be an essential part of development and creating democratic rights and freedoms which have not necessarily been created in all countries across Africa. Uh, technology and growth. Uh, technology is key to future growth, guys. The reality is that internet, internet infrastructure, but also other infrastructures, roads, dams, power plants, um, airports, uh, ports, uh, large buildings in cities, etc. All of these drive the economy. And Africa's technological growth is still behind that of the rest of the world. Um, so technological growth is also an instrument of prosperity and greater um, equality in some regards, but also inequality. Okay, But this is also a key advantage for Africa as it provides a lot of opportunities for firms that build 
infrastructure and technology as there is a great need within Africa and a drive to put these things in place. Okay, as we've also mentioned in terms of wealth, Africa tends to be the poorest continent um, in the world. If you look at this table over here, it varies from GDP, gross domestic product, so that's the amount of business done in a country per citizen within that country. Um, it varies from less than $1,000 per year to $50,000 plus. And if you look at North America, Europe, that's pretty much in the $30,000 to $50,000 range. Asia, $20,000. South America starts to drop off. But um, the bottom parts of Asia and the center of Africa um, are pretty much um, lowest GDPs in the world. So that means the less money that you have, guys, the less uh, money you've got to conduct business so that the people have to spend on uh, business or to spend on products and services, but also the less money that the government collects in taxes that they can spend on uh, building infrastructure and health services, etc. One of the key advantages of doing business in Africa is interconnectivity. So Africa is becoming more interconnected. Borders are opening and goods and services are traveling across borders more easily, i.e. there's reduced tariffs and taxes uh, for goods traveling across borders. So um, NEPAD, which is the uh, new partnership for Africa development is um, notes that there are a number of challenges um, there are a number of challenges that um, there are a number of challenges within Africa including um, inadequate political leadership uh, Africa's institutions that don't have uh, specific capacity, uh, we need to be able to address the burden of disease more effectively in Africa. Uh, this will be um, likely exhibited with the current COVID pandemic where Africa is more likely to have high levels of disease compared to other countries. Uh, so there's a plan to speed up the integration of Africa and open up borders and to make Africa more interconnected. Okay, they also argue that they need to um, strengthen the private sector, in other words, create more private businesses within Africa and this will encourage more foreign direct investments, i.e. Uh, businesses coming from overseas to open businesses within Africa. So, uh, it's about making things happen within Africa and NEPAD has got great hope for Africa in terms of uh, developing and becoming a better business destination. Another challenge within Africa is our regulatory environment, i.e. we tend to have lots of laws and regulations, but we're not so good at regulating or managing these things. So um, a problem within Africa is lots of laws and regulations, but not such strong property rights. So there's examples where um, people get locked up. Uh, because business deals have gone wrong or that property is simply stolen from people, etc., uh, or taken away from people, which does not encourage foreign investment because people get worried that the money that they invest will be lost at the end of the day. So there's a big push to reform our um, regulatory environments and make them more business friendly. If 
you look at the next slide, it's quite an interesting slide because it, it mentions the amount of days that it takes to start a new business, i.e. how much red tape is there involved in starting a new business and how expensive is it to start a new business. So if you look at this, guys, um, the most friendly country probably, or one of the most friendly countries um, in the world, um, is Australia. It takes two days to start a business and it costs less than 1% of the business's annual income in fees and license fees, etc. Uh, so, high protection of investors' rights. Uh, they enforce contracts very highly in Australia and um, the cost of enforcing contracts is not very expensive. So if you're opening a business in Australia, you can do so very quickly and it's not going to cost you a lot of money and it's pretty safe. Compare that, for example, with the, the DRC, which is the un other end of the scale. It cost, takes you 150 days to open a business um, and the cost is almost four times one year's business turnover that will cost you in license fees and tax etc to open business uh, there it's very difficult to employ people they've got a high rigid rigidity of employment index and uh, your investment is poorly protected it's fairly low the protection index compared to say the United States which has 8.3 it's a score out of um, well, it's actually supposed to be out of seven, so I'm not sure how the United States gets to um, 8.3 on the scale. But um, then it's difficult to enforce contracts and it's very expensive to take people to court who have not stuck to contracts. South Africa takes on average 22 days to start a business and 6% of one year's turnover. So it's not very expensive and it is fairly quick to start a new business. Uh, but um, our employment rigidity is 35, which maybe is a little bit low. It's probably a bit higher now. Uh, but we are very high on protecting investors' rights, which is very important. We're almost at the same level as the United States. And... Um, we're fairly high on enforcing contracts, but it's not that cheap to enforce contracts at the end of the day, although we're towards the end of the scale. Perhaps the best country to open a business in is Singapore, three days, um, almost half a percent of a year's turnover, no rigidity um, in employment, uh, your investors' rights are protected, uh, your Enforcement of contract is very high and the costs are not particularly high. So this gives you an idea to compare countries in terms of investment, etc. between those countries. So just to give you a... Um, Insight into those different index, my rigidity of employment index in the, on the previous slide is how difficult it is to hire people that you need, um, how much uh, red tape there is about the hours that they work, and how difficult it is to fire people at the end of the day. And if you think of these three measures, South Africa is fairly high on all of these, i.e. it's difficult to find skilled labor. Um, you have very strong laws around how many hours people can work and when they can work, etc. And it's quite difficult to fire people. My disclosure index is how much a business is required to make public in terms of ownership, voting agreements, who the auditors are, and... Um, financial and ownership information. So how transparent is information about business in that country? And then contract enforcement relates to the degree to which um, the courts will 
enforce contracts and how difficult it is to get the courts to do this and how expensive it is to get the courts to do this. Okay, why do business... Sorry. So why do business in Africa? Um, the positive aspects. Guys, we've already touched on these aspects already. So we said Africa offers the highest foreign direct investments in the world. Africa's markets are undeveloped. So if you open a business in Africa, you're likely to have lots of customers because they do not or then are not existing businesses that have already tapped into this market. An example here, the ShopRite Checkers that has moved across Africa, opened up supermarkets in many countries and are profiting greatly from this because there are not large supermarket chains in these countries already. Compared to, say, a developed country where you open a supermarket, then there are already 10 existing supermarkets that are competing with you, as in South Africa. If Africa were an, a country, it would have the world's 10th largest economy. So even though Africa is poor, there is a lot of money in Africa um, as a whole. So it does mean that there is customers to be accessed at the end of the day and there is money to be spent. So it does not simply mean that uh, because Africa is poor that it is not good for business. Uh, because we have about 10% of the gross domestic product of the world. Numbers here are incorrect. In fact, Africa currently has 1.3 billion people, i.e., guys, there's a lot of customers. And even if they are the poor, they are the bottom of the pyramid. They need things, guys. So they need food, they need fuel, they need data, uh, they need housing, etc. So there's huge opportunities for business with lots and lots of customers to be accessed. As I've already said, poverty can create opportunities, bottom of the pyramid, um, in the previous paragraph I, or the previous statements I made, um, that these people need goods and services. Um, we are the fastest growing area in telecommunications, while other countries um, have huge amounts of cell phone um, infiltration. So, um, Africa, South Africa is exception here. We've got about one and a half to two cell phones for every person in South Africa. Many countries in Africa do not have even close to this rate, so it provides huge opportunities for cell phone countries and data access, etc., internet um, access firms to travel into Africa. Uh, Africa is also becoming more strategically important within the global economy. Uh, this is evidenced in um, huge investment by China in Africa. They are building ports, roads, bridges, railways, etc. They're not doing this because they are this kind, benevolent country. They're doing this because Africa has strategic importance. As we mentioned, Africa has got half of the world's fertile lands and a huge amount of this is under uh, resourced, which has the consequence that um, Africa has a huge potential for providing food for the world, but as we always have, we also provide the world's um, raw materials or a huge amount of the raw materials required by the world, but we've also got uh, cheap labor and our labor is becoming more skilled. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities within Africa and Africa is becoming of global strategic importance. Okay, so, um, the next point relates to pretty much what I've said in the earlier one, that we are globally strategically important, i.e. we can feed the world, the globe, uh, we provide resources that the large the world's economy needs to function on, and um, we becoming an incredibly important marketplace because of the size of our population and growing wealth, etc. 
Okay. One of the important things is also that the perceived risk of doing business in Africa is not as great as it is believed to be. So while it is risky doing business in Africa and you could lose your shirt, um, the reality is that in many instances um, it's not nearly as risky as it is often put, um, portrayed by the Western media, etc. Um, the um, businesses are um, so it's, it's um, actually great opportunities to do business in Africa. And point over here, NEPAD, and increasing regional integration. As we've mentioned in the earlier lectures, the more regions become integrated, the more effectively um, you can do business. So it becomes easier to locate a factory in one country and transport your goods across borders, etc., Um, okay. Guys, I'm going to um, put up a little video about business opportunities in Africa and different ideas for doing business in Africa. And I'm going to expect you to go and look at these videos and uh, identify different opportunities for doing business in Africa. And I'm going to put this up as a separate slideshow on uh, Blackboard. Um, so this will be one of the questions that will be important in terms of uh, the assignment, or in terms of the final assessment, rather, so exam or test. So, uh, I'm not going to worry so much about the slide here. Uh, okay, so they are going to... In relation to this chapter, there are three key questions. Okay, question number one is, why would multinational corporations consider doing business in Africa? Question number two is what would discourage them from doing business in Africa. So I want you to look at at least uh, five or six points, and you need to discuss five or six points based on the discussion above. Um, you've got all the information here, so I'm not going to go through uh, the feedback here. You need to work out these questions, guys, because it's guaranteed that in your final exam, you will either have a question on why would multinational corporations do business in Africa or why would they be discouraged from doing business in Africa? Or the third question... My third question over here, you need to go and look at the two videos that um, you need to go and have a look at the two videos that I've put on Blackboard and identify different business um you could start in Africa. Um I think this is going to be particularly important guys because the reality is that with the COVID nineteen pandemic large corporations are going to hire less people, people are losing their jobs, etc. And we're going to have to develop a more entrepreneurial orientation. So I want you to look at those 10 videos and identify at least 10 business opportunities that you could consider starting in Africa. And I'm not going to feedback it for you guys. You need to sit down and you need to work out a question on it. And I guarantee you that you will get one possibly two of these questions in your final exam. Thank you very much.